Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus today. We thank you, Lord God, that across the days of this week as we have met in this room with Pastor Todd and Lord, with the immersion services, we thank you that in miraculous ways you met with people in these waters. Your presence was so sweet and powerful in this place. And Lord, we just want you to know you, you have all authority here. And, and we want you to be, this is your house. And so make your house what you want your house to be. We thank you that we've had the opportunity to be here to worship together today. And I ask you, Lord God, for your strength in my voice and in my body to preach the word you've given. And give us the grace today to receive it and hear it. I pray these things in Jesus' name, in agreement with my family in Christ. Everyone say amen. I want to talk to you about being in the faith. Last Sunday, we read these verses together from 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, which says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith. The King James says, even our faith. That's what we talked about last Sunday. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God. You have an advantage going out into life over anybody else because you believe Jesus is the Son of God. You are walking out into life with the wild card the unbeliever can't play because you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. This week I want to read this verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5 which says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you. Do you know that? Unless indeed you are disqualified. This week I want to talk about being in the faith. That word faith in that verse right there is the same word translated in last week's verses, which is faith is the belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence, whether in God or in Christ. Faith is the conviction of the truth of anything. You, are, you believe something to be true. This week, that same word has the addition of this. Faith is a strong and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah, through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Does your faith stand the test? That's literally what that word, would you go back to uh, 2 Corinthians 13 and 5? That is literally what that word disqualified means, that last word. It means, does your faith stand the test? It's funny because if I were to read that verse to you from the King James Version this morning, it says, except ye be reprobates. <laughs> and I thought to myself, wow, I'm pretty sure there's no church growth strategy that includes calling your congregation reprobates. But I cooled my jets a little bit, and I did some research, some digging, and I found that the literal translation for reprobate, disqualified, is not standing the test. Not standing the test. Church, the Bible tells us that our faith will be tested. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Well, I don't want any patience. Whether you want it or not, you're going to need it. And the testing of your faith. Why doesn't God answer my prayer when I want him to answer my prayer? Your faith is being tested. 
it's being put to the test. But we are also told about the beautiful end result of tested and proven faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gold, widely considered the most precious of all the valuable metals. Any true and worthy economy will have its money backed by gold. But to God, our faith, put to the test, standing the test, comes out purer and more precious to him than the most refined gold in the world. Remember Hebrews 11 and 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. But what if your faith does stand the test? What are the possibilities if you possess a faith that only became more purified through the testing? As I look at the promises of God, I think the sky is the limit if we have a faith that will stand the test. But it's going to take a faith that will stand the test. That's why Paul writes to us in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, examine yourselves, test yourselves. Your faith is too precious to allow it to lie dormant. In fact, your faith is too precious to skip the testing. I get it. Who likes tests? Who wants to be tested? No one likes the heat to be dialed up in their life. But the gold isn't truly precious until it's been refined by the fire. Until it stood the test. So let's examine ourselves to see if we really are in the faith. I have two thoughts, two views two examinations of this. Can you stand with me for that long? You can sit. You don't have to stand. Not literally. First thought when it comes to examining ourselves. Is it obvious that Christ is in my life? Is it obvious that my life is in Christ? In the faith means, first of all, relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're not in the faith. It begins with that relationship. Does my salvation testimony stand the test? Do my life choices reflect that I am born again? Does my lifestyle confirm my faith in Christ or does it contradict my confession of faith? Am I in Christ? It's not my job to make that examination of your life. It's not your job to make that examination of my life. It's our jobs to make that examination of our own selves. Am I in the faith? Is it obvious that Christ is in my life? Galatians 2 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. A born-again relationship with Jesus Christ isn't like pre-ordering a ticket for a future event. But it's a brand new lifestyle. And it imitates and reproduces what it sees in Jesus. I prayed a prayer, so now I'm automatically punched and stamped and ready to go to heaven. No, you prayed a prayer and you entered into a relationship that God wants to have with you for the rest of your life. 
and that will one day ultimately lead you into eternity. It is a lifestyle that mirrors the heart of Jesus. Does your life testimony stand the test? Are you in the faith? Are you truly in relationship with Jesus or are you in just in relationship with his church? The word of God says examine yourselves. Would Jesus be preoccupied with what preoccupies you? Would Jesus interact with people the way you interact with people? Would Jesus handle your finances the way you handle your finances? Oh, I'm meddling today. Would Jesus be entertained by what entertains you? I haven't been able to say it in a long time, but you've got to love me to go to heaven. Would Jesus say the things you say? If you really believe he is with you, would you take him the places you go? I'm not trying to be heavy this morning, but what truly would be heavy is coming to the end of your run on this earth, having a form of godliness, but having denied its power. Having lived in and around the things of God, but never truly becoming a follower of Jesus. Do you have a confession of faith that says, Jesus is my Lord? Does your confession stand the test? of examining your life for the evidence of it. Am I in the faith? Am I in Christ Jesus? Don't worry, I'm not spying on you. I don't have people that I've hired to follow you to see what you're doing with your life. The rest, But I don't need to because God's got the Holy Ghost. And... Uh, he can deal with you the same way he can deal with me, right? Examine yourselves. Am I in the faith? Am I in relationship with Jesus Christ? And does my life prove it? Second thought. That's exam number one. Let's do exam number two because I want you to like me before we leave today. Second thought, second exam. Do I stand firm on God's promises or am I easily moved from them? Do I stand firm on God's promises or am I easily moved from them? So we've examined ourselves, our relationship with Jesus. We've come to the, cl the conclusion every day I endeavor to please him and walk as closely with him as possible. I'm saved and I wouldn't trade it for the world and I'll tell anyone who asks I love Jesus. That's settled. But then real life sets in for even those who make that confession. And even believers are tested by sicknesses and afflictions. Even believers are challenged by circumstances outside our control. We are dealt unexpected blows. We lose our job. We lose someone we love. The door of opportunity didn't open that we were sure was going to open. The promotion bypasses us. Life's stuff. Anybody experience life's stuff? It happens. I got saved when I was young, 17, I came to know the Lord, and it didn't stop life's stuff. Mm. Doggone it. You know, you know the feeling. You deal with it too. You just said you did. Do we still stand on the promises of God, or do we become the victim of the emotions attached to the afflictions and the struggles? Are we still in the faith during the test called disappointment? Are we still in the faith during the test called hope deferred? 
Are we still in the faith when it seems like everything life is throwing at us is the opposite of what God says? Do we still stand on the promises of God or have we been moved away from them? Do we believe God or do we believe the world? Do we believe God or do we believe what we see, hear, smell, touch, and feel? Isn't it interesting that God chooses perhaps the one thing that humanity struggles with the most as his avenue of relationship and blessing? Faith. Isn't it interesting that the Bible doesn't say without righteousness it is impossible to please God? But it says without faith. Well, righteousness is important. We need him to impart his righteousness and we need to live in his righteousness. And that whole divine exchange we sang about and talked about, it's important. But the Bible says it's without faith it's impossible to please him. Are we standing on God's promises or are we easily moved from them when life doesn't go the way we planned it out? There were quite a few, well, let me say this first. I understand that there's a devil who doesn't want your faith to flourish. But there's also a loving heavenly father who wants your faith to make a difference in this world. And he knows that your faith requires testing to make it the kind of faith that will make a difference in this world. The Bible says that he's given to each of us a measure of faith, but we're supposed to do something with that measure of faith. We're supposed to rejoice when we're tried by various tests because we know the testing of our faith produces something in us that comes out like refined, pure gold. There are quite a few occasions where Jesus would say something like this, as in Matthew 6 and 30. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now, I have never in my life pictured Jesus as angry when he said this. I've always gotten the image of him having that wry little smile on his face with eyes, big loving eyes, wide open, looking at you as if he were saying, you silly thing, what makes you think I wouldn't be right here in the middle of this taking care of you? And yet, let his commentary be yet another measure of the examination of our faith. If we were worried about what we were going to eat and what we were going to wear, would we be able to say, you know what, he feeds the birds, and you know what, he clothes the flowers. What am I worrying about? Because I'm more valuable to him than a whole flock of birds. I'm more valuable to him than a whole field of flowers. Oh, you a little faith. Let it be another measuring stick. Am I in the faith? Does my faith stand the test? Will I stand on the promises of God? Because the God who made the promise is faithful. I think we all know on some level that not everything goes according to our plan or preference. Right? Or... or is there someone here that you've had your life plotted out perfectly and it all went exactly the way you thought it would? <laughs> There's an altar right here. We'll pray for you. I want the prayer team to come back to the front. And I would. No. <laughs> if that were true, I would love to sit down and hear your story, my friend. Yeah. Uh, The question will always be when things don't go according to our plan or preference, how do I handle it? Will it lead me to an examination of the quality of my faith or will it cause me to think God really isn't true and faithful? Where will it lead you? I'm going to tell you something here today because I believe God's word. Faith 
has a payday. Faith has a payday. We are not wasting our time believing God. We may have to stand the test, but the Bible told us in advance it would be put through the test. I think we get this idea that we can play, pray one little prayer and then poof, we get our answer. No, God is going to test our faith so that it can believe him for more and more and more and more. And if we are going to be so easily discouraged when we're asking him for the smaller things in life, how will our faith ever grow to the point that we can move mountains with it? Let us examine ourselves as to whether we are in the faith. Faith has a payday. Everything you're believing God for has a God answer. But faith also has tests. But will we allow the tests to squash our faith? That's what the devil wants it to do. Or will we cooperate with the tests and come out the other side with greater and purer faith? Because that's what Jesus wants to do. Let's look at one more thing that Jesus says about faith. Giving you some backstory about from the verses that we're going to read. There was a day that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem with his disciples and he saw a fig tree and he thought, I'm going to go see if there are any figs. Well, it wasn't fig season, but Jesus went to look to the tree anyway. And there were no figs and he just simply said, let no one ever eat of your fruit again. And they went on about their business. Well, the next day, they came back into Jerusalem and they passed that fig tree again. And the disciples saw it and says, it's all dried up and withered up. It's dead. It's dead. How can it be dead already? You just, you just said, let no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the next day, it's dead. And this is what Jesus said in response. Matthew 21 and 20, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I say to you, if you, you need to read that verse and say, if I, if I have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but you will also, if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. But the problem is, it takes a tested and tried faith to move the mountain. And somewhere along life's journey, when we didn't stand up to the test, we gave up on believing God. And our faith never grew to the point was never tested enough to the point, never grown enough, never purified enough where it could move a mountain. And to be honest, maybe you have a different perception, but in, in, my, in my eyes, not much about everyday life requires a lot of faith. We are able, for the most part, to skate through our days on autopilot. We know the routine. I get up, I make the breakfast, I get the kids ready for school, I go off to the job, I know what they expect of me there, I get off at such and such a time, I go home, I make the dinner, I get things, the, the, whatever chores we can all do before we watch a little TV and go to bed. It doesn't take a lot of faith to do the routine of life every day. Just that everyday stuff. And because of it, it means our faith isn't necessarily exercised well. If I want to get stronger physically, I'm going to have to work out and I'm going to have to lift weights. How do muscles get stronger? Through resistance. Resistance training. Lifting, pushing, pulling weights, resistance. 
The same principle applies to your faith. How is your faith going to get stronger so you can believe God for the bigger and better things through resistance? I know that that's not pleasant. You want it, you, uh, we all want easy street. I, I want it to be as easy as possible. But God shows us in his word, if we're going to be world shakers, we're going to need a faith that is able to stand the test, that's going to be able to deal with the resistance. Because right there, Jesus either said something that he lied about, or it's a truth that we haven't tapped into yet. So did he lie to us or is it the truth? The one who lied to you is says, well, that's what it was back then, but that's not how God works now. That person lied to you. This is where God wants us to be in life. But did our faith stand the test? You know, when the church disappointed us, when family disappointed us, when friends turned against us, when I was believing for, for this thing and it didn't happen, I, I, I just, I said, well, if that's how it's going to be, I'm just going to go do my own thing. Why should I pray? Why should I believe for anything? And all that does is leave us in a place where our gold isn't pure. It isn't tried and it isn't tested. If you have faith and do not doubt, is what Jesus said. If you have faith and do not doubt, you will move mountains. This is the quality of faith God wants to produce in us. But have we examined ourselves to see whether we are even in the faith? Faith for the promises of God must be seeded and nurtured in the faith of a personal relationship with God. If it's seated there, then we can see tests as opportunities for faith to be purified rather than tests being an opportunity for disappointments that make us believe God doesn't care. Listen, I'm with you. I've had times in my life that I said, God, you don't even care about what's going on in my life right now. I have prayed a thousand times and you've never done anything about it. So I guess I'm just going to ignore you for a while. Oh, you've never done that. I'm sorry. I made a confession there. I probably should have never made. But purified faith will never speak contrary to what God says. Purified faith will never consider backing away from Jesus. Purified faith will never speak according to the current emotional state. <laughs> Purified faith will stand the test. I'm going to say this and then we're going to pray and go home and have lunch and a nap. Don't blow this off as just another sermon. Because God wants your faith to stand the test. Don't get derailed so easily. Don't get discouraged ever. Don't give in to the emotions that tell you opposite of what God says. Examine yourself. When life is hard, when it's not going the way you want it to go, you need to know God knew it would go this way. So God, what are you doing with it? What are you doing in me through it? I, I'm with you. I want what he's handing out to me, but I'm not going to get what he's handing out to me until it goes through what he's doing in me. You know? I mean, if Joseph, if you go back to a Bible story in the Old Testament, Joseph had dreams that he would rule over his family, over his brothers, that they would bow down to him. He had dreams that he was going to be great. But you know what he did? You know, when we first are introduced to Joseph, we find out that he's spoiled because he's his daddy's favorite son, and he would tattletale on what his brothers were doing all the time and that he was immature and telling them, well, I had a dream and you're all going to bow down to me. If God would have given him his promise at that time of his life, he wouldn't have been ready to handle it. 
well, I'm not like Joseph. Really? Really? You all are the most mature people in every area of life, right? Then you should be pastoring me. <laughs> Examine yourselves. Test yourselves. Are you in the faith? Don't be discouraged. This life, it's going to take faith. We cannot bypass faith. We cannot. Because it's the only thing that God, it's, it's, it's the only thing that we can displease God with, a lack of it. So, all right, put me through the test if you have to, Lord, but make sure I stand the test. Help me to stand in it and come out the other side. Stand with me this morning. I'm done.